Okay, so uh, in, the, in the abstract I described a little bit more the physics, uh, possible physics answer the question, but here I'll, I'll skip that and, uh, and uh, move on to, to, to discuss this, uh, this issue. I mean, as some of you may know, uh, Bohm, when he kind of later reinterpreted his 52 theory, he came to the view that the, you know, the Schrodinger wave is not to be regarded as a field of force, but rather as a field of information. And in this, it means information to the electron, not to, not to us in, in this context. And the question that he was really interested in was whether this would help us to understand how mind and matter are related. Let me see, where, where do I point this? Oh, it's the other one, sorry. Yeah, it's the other one. Okay, great. So here, here's Dave and, and Sarah, and, and uh, the picture conveys a lot of the atmosphere, how it was to, to be with them and work with them. And Sarah was, of course, active also uh, with the uh, Prockwood Park School, which uh, Christian Murdy founded, and, and Dave was very interested in working there. But also later on, the dialogue experiments, which I mentioned at the very beginning. So. And and uh, and so uh, so this is this is just to convey the atmosphere in which we often worked and discussed. Now, the the problem here <coughs> that I'll briefly address is is has a long history, of course, Descartes' idea of you know my matter interaction, but even Plato in the Phaedo raises the issue that the, that. Uh, when I, when I do something, uh, is it because of, of, the, of my uh, bones and muscles or rather the choice of the best? You know, is, is, is the true cause of my actions something mental or something physical? And, and of course, Plato feels that it, it's the mental. And in modern discussion, as we heard from Stuart, conscious experience, it has been, you know, target of multidisciplinary research. Uh, and, and so uh, one problem there is it's difficult to understand what, if any, causal role consciousness would play. And for some people, that actually calls into question the existence of consciousness as autonomous category. You know, there are philosophers who think that an existence without causal powers is an existence not worth having. So in a way, you, it's kind of, it could amount to eliminating consciousness altogether. And maybe sometimes we, you know, Maybe even in this conference, for, sometimes one gets implicit or explicit statements that uh, consciousness might not really, you know, if it's all just matter, you know, all just particles and interacting mechanically, so it's not clear. And now there's another argument in, in, in ph many philosophers of, or other idea, really, other philosophers of mind hold, the so-called causal closure of the physical domain. Uh, which seems to make it impossible for a non-physical consciousness to influence the course of physical events. And of course, you can easily solve the problem if you can show that consciousness is physical. But that, of course, is exactly the hard problem, as David Chalmers formulated, that how possibly could something like subjective conscious experience arise from objective physical process. And I think many people, not everybody, but many people accept that there is a genuine hard problem there. So it, there's not necessarily an easy answer. Now, of course, even in philosophy, there has been a bit of criticism, uh, kind of a self-critique self or auto-critique recently, especially by Leidman Ross. And, and uh, you know, some philosophy actually has very weak connection to uh, science and best theories of physics. So even philosophers who call themselves physicalists and say that, you know, we take physics seriously, you really, often you don't find any physics. Maybe you find A-level chemistry, like Leidemann and Ross would say, but nothing about really the new physics. So um, what we need, we could say what we need is really a scientific metaphysics and a kind of general framework that's implied by our best theories in physics and the special sciences. So not just physics, but you know, we have to really look at the whole picture. And this is, of course, what David Bohm was very, very much interested in. 
And, and so for Bohm, in the end, you could say that the general framework is the simplicate order framework, which then contains the Bohm theory or, or you know, Bohmian mechanics or the onto what, you know, what they call ontological interpretation of quantum theory. And I have actually kind of a fairly, I tried to make an accessible introduction to, to some of these ideas also in my 2007 book. Okay, so, uh, according to Bohm and highly, the ontological interpretation implies some radically new ideas about the nature of quantum mechanical processes. In particular, it proposes that a new type of holistic active information plays a key role at a quantum level. And the way I would put it is that this involves a radical change in what we mean by physics and the physical, thus opening up new ways of tackling the traditional mind matter problem. So I did actually my thesis in, in, at the University of Helsinki on, on this, and, and while also interacting with Bohm quite a lot, that we actually were, had a paper with Bohm which, is, uh, which was left unfinished as he died in 1992, but, but perhaps that I should finally also bring that into uh, publication. But the basic idea is that uh, information is a new fundamental category and it could connect uh, the physical and the mental domains. And of course, in case there are people here who haven't been the other days, just a very quick, quick uh, reminder of the, of the Bohm theory, or the ontological interpretation, where the electron is a particle which has a well-defined position momentum, and there's also this uh, field satisfying the Schrodinger equation, which is guiding it. And, and just a reminder that, you know, because people, for non-physicists, it's very confusing. They read popular writings about quantum mechanics, and every, everybody says something different. But in this model, we just say that it's particle and field, or as Bohm used to say, an inseparable union of a particle and a field. So he didn't want to make a dualism by postulating the two things. And here's a little bit of an illustration, just the way, way it works in the two slits. In just the, not, this is not an accurate, but it's just to give you a picture of what's more happening. And here's one slide I, I, I stole from Basil, because I don't know how to make such nice, nice pictures. But anyway, there you can see see the, uh, see the, uh, <clears throat> some of these uh, the trajectories, the quantum potential, and, and the uh, <clears throat> overall our picture. And what we'll focus is now on the quantum potential, uh, what, of course, Bohm himself thought that this is strange and arbitrary, and then he also worried about, the other thing he worried about was that the wave function lives in configuration space, but when he began to re-examine the uh, theory in the 70s, uh, he, he noticed something new, a new way of looking at it. So with classical fields, the potential depends on the amplitude. So like the size of water wave would determine the effect the wave has on a floating object. Whereas with the quantum potential, the effect actually only depends on the form or shape of the field. Mathematically, it's the second spatial derivative of the amplitude. So the quantum field is not pushing and pulling the particle mechanically like a water wave in the bohm, in bohm, bohm highly picture. Uh, sometimes people just you know, say that it is, but at least if you, if you read there, the way they took it, it doesn't. It's rather that the quantum field literally puts form into or informs the particle to behave in a certain way which means that the electron is then moving under its own energy that's being informed by the form of the quantum field. So it's a kind of, if you like, an Aristotelian notion, not exactly the same, but there's something, it smells Aristotelian form or formative cause to some extent. Now, Bohm would say that this is actually an instance of a general feature of active information that we see operating at many levels of nature. And here, the basic idea is that uh, we have a form that carries very little energy, it enters a greater energy, and as a result, the form of the greater energy becomes the same as that of the smaller energy. So it, again, it's, it's quite a simple idea. Perhaps easy to see artificial devices, so if you consider a ship on autopilot, 
uh, guided by radio waves, the waves are not pushing and pulling the ship, rather it's the form of the waves, which, which then reflects the form of the environment, which is then taken up by the autopilot and used to direct the ship. And analogously, Bohm was suggesting the quantum field contains information about the environment of the particle, such as slates, but it could be also flux lines or, or you know, gravitational potential differences. And, and then this information determines the movement of the particle along with the classical forces. But again, notice this is a kind of an information pot potential. You get many other similar examples, of course, with computers, with the DNA, you could say that it's really informing. It also applies in subjective experience, like when you're reading a map, map the information starts building up in your mind. And here in the conference, actually, Maneli Derakshani pointed out that, that something, this is sort of beyond me, but anyway, that, that even uh, in, uh, in sort of classical Brownian motion, you would have something very similar. And if you read carefully the Bohm highly, you, you notice that they actually also point out that the classical potential can also be seen as an information potential, but it's still different from the, from the quantum potential. So who knows, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe classical physics is not as classical as we thought. And that, this doesn't necessarily mean that we therefore reduce quantum mechanics to classical. It could be also the other way around, a little bit. <laughs> well. Okay, now this is a radical proposal. You see, in the two first days of the conference, nobody really mentioned the active information. So obviously, although we are talking about BOM, it's not something that people feel happy or comfortable about. They kind of acknowledge it already, you know, when they proposed this back in 83, because they write that, uh, that this is a far more subtle and dynamic notion than any others that have hitherto been supposed to be fundamental in physics. So BOM was well aware, I mean, if this is true, then you know, it's to, it's to be expected that people, if we are in another paradigm, we will not take this on board. So this is really what, what uh, might be going on, or else this is just not worth giving attention to. But I leave that as a question to consider. Okay. And those of you who wonder about the information, actually Basil has written some nice papers also about and, and you know, there's some interesting work being done here, but just very briefly, uh, the active information is um, uh, um, <clears throat> really, in, we have to think of this as an information for the electron as an objective commodity. And that, that's it's difficult for many people. I, I, I did my master's thesis on this at Sussex University, and the external examiner, I, no, he liked the thesis, but then he said information, of course, is always subjective, and then to supervise, so yes, and myself, we were just laughing together. Okay, well, what can we do? So that you know, the whole point of the thesis was to, to to argue that there might be something also. We could also look at information in objective sense. In the same way, the DNA is information for the cell; it's not information for us. Okay, it's a simple point, but somehow it's it's difficult. We use the concept of information in so many different ways. So. But this is kind of also, it's like the instructions. But it's also about the environment, and it's for the electron, and it's instructing the electron. So, you know, some of you may recognize those senses, okay? And of course, the, uh, so the form dependence was one thing that Bohm thought was very interesting. But of course, as you know, and as for example, Tim Maudlin has emphasized that for Bohm, wholeness was very important. And, and uh, so there's no locality, through the quantum potential. But this is something that Bohm thought was even more important. It's what he calls objective wholeness. And here, the, in this many particle system, he would say that the interaction can be thought of depending on what he called a common pool of information belonging to the system as a whole, in a way that is not analyzable in terms of pre assigned relationship between individual particles. And, and here, this also means that this thing is, is now in, uh, uh, for many particles, the wave function lives in configuration space. Bohm was worried about that in, in, the, you know, in the 50s and 60s because he, it's difficult to make sense of a physical field. However, he said that if we think of this as, as an information, then it's more natural to think of information as multidimensional. There are still questions to be answered, but this is something 
And again, I think we have now discussions of wave function realism, where this question doesn't, you know, the Bohm idea doesn't come up. Although I think it's kind of, it has many advantages in comparison to some of the other ideas. But still, maybe it's just a paradigm. It's not, like, I think Henry Stapp once told me that the time is not ripe yet for, for these ideas, but maybe one day it, 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 it would be. A... Now, the other thing here is that uh, you have, what one has to realize here is that the whole organizes the parts, and there's the philosopher uh, Jonathan Schaffer who has written many articles which resonate quite well with, the, uh, with this idea. And so, um, <clears throat> One should emphasize here that the, uh, the ontological interpretation and also the implicate orders scheme more generally, it, it does suggest a holistic view of nature. And this does not deny the, it doesn't deny the existence of the parts, but it does suggest that the whole is primary and the parts are derivative. When, and now if we look at Bohmian mechanics, uh, you know, people talk about the primitive ontology with, with the position of particles. So that's very different. It seems, it, does that mean that somehow the parts are primary? And, you know, physics, physics is about parts. And, and uh, one could even say that these are two different ideologies. And, and maybe we should recognize them as such. And, and not think that one of them is science and, and, and the other one is ideology. Maybe, and, and, you know, we should maybe go to a deeper level of, of dialogue between these two different approaches and see that other things may, might affect who likes what. It's not as if somebody gets it. The idea there is also that we can't read our metaphysics directly from science. There are, you know, all, always other, other things that influence it. And he, this is just to be... I, again, I just mentioned that, and there's actually the reference to uh, Schaeffer's paper, which gives kind of a philosophical uh, uh, justification to the, this priority of the whole. And okay. So, uh, <clears throat> and there are a couple of more points that Bohm made about the uh, kind of at the meta level comments of his this whole approach. Bohm did say that. You could actually understand. He said that okay, quantum mechanics is very radical, and that you can understand this in terms of the notion of active information. He admitted that, you know, strictly speaking, you don't need it. You can do everything without active information. However, what he was trying to do was to make quantum theory intelligible in an intuitive sense. That's what he was kind of looking. I think he felt that if we understand something, then we might, you know, that's that's very important and not merely have an instrumentalist approach. And he actually, so he actually said that at least something like the notion of active information is needed if we want to do this. For example, to account for quantum interference and, and also this, you know, the way the state of the whole organizes the parts in things like superconductivity and in the, in the many, many body systems. And he would also say that act, uh, like he was trying to show that the notion of active information, although it may sound crazy, strange when you bring it to physics, it does correspond to a tremendous range of common experience, but we just, as far as physics is concerned, we have devalued this sort of experience. And we have assumed that physical law should contain only mechanical concepts, such as position, momentum, force, etc. And then if we see, well, these don't work, then we jump into instrumentalism. Whereas he says, and this, I would say, could be like Baum's legacy in, in this area, if we, he would say that if we suitably extend the kind of concept that we are willing to admit into physics, for example, to include active information, then we can obtain a much better apprehension of the theory. And this, in turn, may help guide our thinking and physics into new directions. So I think that's the way he, he saw. He didn't feel, okay, we'll, we'll stop at the bomb theory or active information. I think he felt that it, this is a pointer to things like the implicate order and maybe, you know, the sort of things that uh, uh, Roger Penrose was talking about. And, and Basil, of course. Okay. Okay. So I say a little bit about the uh, philosophy of mind mind just to illustrate how the notion could be used in other areas, and this is where my own work has been. been and, and, uh, and so uh, the question being really, well, would this help with the problem of mental causation? 
And, and the uh, <coughs> Bohm himself thought that it could, that it would really help to understand the relationship. And his idea here is that this is very schematic, but still he would say that mental states involve a hierarchy of levels of active information uh, in the sense that we can be, we not only think at one level, but we can become aware of our thinking. And this actually would create then a new higher level of information, which can then organize the lower level bit analogously the way the quantum potential organizes the movement of the particle. And this can sort of go on. I, I go quite quickly here because of the time we get. Now the, uh, <clears throat> so how, how does it connect with matter? Now one would suggest that it's actually natural to extend the quantum ontology. So just as there's a pilot wave guiding the particle, there can be a super pilot wave that can organize the first order pilot wave and so on. And actually Bohm and highly discuss this in, in connection of quantum field theory in the uh, in their book. So we have two hierarchies, one for mind and another for matter. And, and so the next step was to postulate that these are actually the same hierarchy. And now we get an idea of mental causation <coughs> where, where, the, uh, where the, uh, the idea is that the information at the given level of the mind could then act, act downwards and kick into the pilot wave depending on what quantum brain theory might someday tell us. And this can then again be amplified to, to uh, macroscopic sing signals. If you do it in quantum field theory version, then it, you know, it, Basil and Carl Prebram were talking about the dendro possible role of dendritic fields there. And then again, in perception, we could, uh, <coughs> we could uh, understand how it works the other way around. And there's actually a paper which we did with Basil on this, and there's some criticism, including by Ron Chrisley, who is, who is here right now. Okay, now I'll, I will uh, <coughs> skip the uh, uh, consciousness part here uh, because of the, of the time, but, uh, but basically the question we have to ask, Bohm, you know, he died in 92 before the consciousness studies became really big. And so he didn't really address directly the so-called you know, so Hahn problem. And so, uh, <clears throat> so that's why the, uh, we, we need to do some work, and that's what I've been uh, doing. And one thing is to apply the so-called high order theory of scheme for those of you who you know uh, to the active information. You could also look at Tononi's integrated information or Barr's global workspace theory. And, and there I thought, you, for example, if you did a conscious to non-conscious transition in Bohm, it could be when if you have this, what he called a common pool of information, which would correspond to global workspace, if you have factorization, then that might correspond to loss of consciousness. But that's a very schematic idea, but just something that I thought about in this context. And of course, David Chalmers also had this double aspect theory of information, and I've, I've <coughs> also considered the relation to Chalmers' view, but I'll skip over that, that now because uh, I want to get back to Plato to conclude. Okay, so remember, Plato says that for Plato, it's obvious that our physical actions depend upon the choice of the best, and uh, <coughs> Whereas a typical materialist would say, well, it's the physical state that determines the next physical state. And I suggest that the actual, the active information view allows for a naturalistic grounding of Plato's view. Well, this is the Plato's view, but, but I, I won't uh, spend time on this now. And you see, Bohm and Hiley, in their paper measurement, they say that there are good reasons for expecting that quantum theory uh, would be, and, and this quantum information potential would be relevant when we're starting consciousness. And, and this is suggested by the fact that information regarded as correct is active in determining our behavior. While as soon as information is regarded as incorrect, it ceases to be active. So what we could say that our very veridicality judgments play a key role in determining whether or not information acts. And there's a favorite example of Bohm that if I judge a shadow in a dark night to mean an assailant, 
I get a psychosomatic reaction, and if I know this is merely a branch, I'll calm down. We could expand the idea toward Plato and assume that our ethical judgments, the choice of the best, can typically also affect the way information is activated and consequently our behavior. Where the, the bomb, you know, this active information scheme then enables such activity of information to reach all the way to the level of fundamental physics. And here we can then begin to make sense of a perennial, perennial puzzle in Western philosophy, namely <clears throat> the place of and role of minds, meanings, and morals in the physical world. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat>